The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins. He is a priest member of the Society of St. Pius V. He's also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you doing tonight? Very grateful, Tom. Thank you. Good. Grateful that God is still putting up with me. <laughs> and uh, grateful that you're here sure. as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Father, a, a lot has happened since we met last week uh, to record the, the program. We... Uh, we just published our, our latest show, I, I believe it was f three or four days ago, and, and in that time I, I think we've already amassed uh, over 10,000 views on our latest mm -hmm. video. We've uh, received uh, a dozen or so emails on, on the topic of our last show uh, where we kind of gave a response to a Taylor, Dr. Taylor Marshall video where he talked about mm -hmm. St. Robert Bellerman and uh, the, uh, the idea of a, of a heretical pope and the implications of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, this video, Father, this particular video, it has generated an, an enormous amount of, of response and, and feedback from our viewers. Even Dr. Taylor Marshall himself actually tweeted out the link to our video and said that mm -hmm. uh, Father Jenkins recorded a, a nice and, and concise and kind uh, response to his video, and he recommended that, that his mm -hmm. followers watch this, uh, this mm -hmm. video. And, do, do you uh, have the exact I do, I do, Father. I have it. He said... Uh, statement. He said, Father William Jenkins recorded a kind and concise response to the state of Vacantism video that Ryan Grant and I recorded last week on St. Robert Bellarmine and the five opinions on a heretical pope. If you are interested in this debate, it's worth watching. And then he, he posted the link to that. So, Father, why do you think that there has been uh, such a, a response to this, to this video and this particular topic? Because if I'm not mistaken, I don't believe that you said a whole lot in that video that you haven't said before. Uh, so, so why do you think the, the tremendous draw to this program? Well, certainly the exposure uh, given by Dr. Taylor Marshall helped because he's uh, got quite a following and um, is rather prolific in his work. And uh, particularly in the case of uh, Ryan Grant, he had a, a very scholarly, gentlemanly, Catholic man there speaking from his knowledge of the, uh, the works of St. Robert Bellarmine. And uh, I think the topic itself, though, is a very, very burning topic among Catholics today. Yes. Um, there are those who still have the old faith, the traditional faith, in their hearts and their <laughs> souls. They have the virtue of faith, and they actually have the belief of the doctrines of the faith, still. And they realize that there's something radically wrong. There's something terribly wrong in the Vatican, right? They're beginning to realize that uh, the legacy of Vatican II has been very, very deleterious to the faith. An enormous amount of damage has been to, done to the church, uh, following, not only following upon Vatican II, not only post hope but propter hope because of what was installed at Vatican II and the changes that came in following Vatican II, this, this, this whirlwind of changes that actually constitute a revolution. I think people are beginning to realize that. Uh, I think Dr. Marshall's book also, Infiltration, has given people a sense that what has happened to the church really is not an accident. It's not a development. It is a revolution that was carried off by the enemies of the church uh, due to the infiltration of the Mason, Masons, notably, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and the modernists, certainly the modernists have carried off the revolution of Vatican II. And this is the result, the chaos that has come in with Francis. Francis kind of personifies that revolution himself right now. So, um, <clears throat> of course, this has caused uh, some serious divisions as people are trying to explain as Catholics, they're trying to explain what's happened to the church. And they're trying to find a, uh, the practical answer. Well, what do I do now? What is the Catholic position to hold? That's why this controversy um, has led them to the writings of St. Robert, Robert Bellerin, because it all ultimately comes back to what has happened to the papacy. 
And uh, we see in Francis now um, kind of the apotheosis of modernism, right? And um, is he the ultimate goal of modernism? Actually, he, he is the quintessential modernist pope, right? He's right out of the pages of Bashendi, uh, the, the encyclical, the 1907 encyclical in which St. Pius X condemned the errors of the modernists. It's as though Francis embodies everything that was condemned in that encyclical of St. Pius X in 1907. Uh, right down to his synodal church and his synodal path that he outlines, like this new form of church that he's creating. Um, so, yes, I mean, these issues uh, go right to the heart of what it is to be Catholic right now, and people are scrambling to try to understand and trying to apply and trying to find their way through and, and, and to take the Catholic approach to know what to do about these developments. And there is a certain amount of... Um, a disagreement, obviously, among those who still have the faith. I mean, we know that there are many pe people out there who still have the Catholic faith in their hearts, have the virtue of faith, and they have the belief in the faith, the actual doctrines of the Church, because we find them coming back to the traditional Mass. Sunday by Sunday, month by month, we find them uh, finding their way back to the traditional faith, the, the traditional Mass, the traditional sacraments, the traditional, just the, the whole... Cat, traditional Catholic religion. Mm -hmm. And the reason that they find their way back there uh, to practicing the traditional Catholic religion is because they do have the faith. And they realize that what's going on in this new order of religion that the modernists have created does not correspond to what they believe. And so they've been living a kind of a contradiction between what they believe and what they've been doing in the modernists. Uh, new religion. I mean, that was basically, the Novus Ordo is the practice of modernism. And so they come back to the traditional faith and see the traditional mass, traditional sacraments, they learn the traditional catechisms and so on. Then they realize, well, this is my faith. This is what I really believe. So it's wonderful to see that. After all those years out in the cold of the Novus Ordo, people find their way back because they still have the faith. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, what I've been urging people to do all along, you know, to come back to the practice of the traditional faith, which is the traditional Catholic religion, and uh, refuse to go along with the modernist revolution. Um, <clears throat> of course, the, the ultimate question in many people's minds is, well, what, what about the papacy? What happens to the papacy in the midst of all this? And, uh, you know, I see Francis is adulterating the papacy, like he's adulterating most everything else he touches, right? And he's misrepresenting it. He's actually having an effect in getting even conservative Novus, New Order Catholics to redefine what they believe about the papacy because they're tailoring it to Francis and what he is doing. Uh, so even unconsciously, even those who are resisting so much of the modernism that he's spouting are actually uh, being affected adversely by his example to adjust their concept of the very papacy around Francis. And this is not good at all. You know? um, it's very, very deleterious to their faith. So, in any case, uh, that's why I coined the term Sidious Cervantes, because I think we have to preserve from Francis the very concept of what the papacy really is, mm -hmm. and safeguard it against his malicious and malign influence there. <clears throat> A malignant influence. Um, but in any case, uh, you know, there's perhaps no, no question more, uh, for some reason the German word umstritten comes to mind, the more <clears throat> controverted, more, more of a battleground than the question of what they like to call city vacantism. Sure. <clears throat> because you have the, the dogmatic city vacantist who, uh, you know, uh, treated as almost, it is, it is a dogma of faith that Francis is, could not be the Pope. And then you have the dogmatic, Bacante, the, 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 the dogmatic other side saying, no, he is the Pope, and you cannot even question that he's the Pope. And I think this is the great contribution that Dr. Marshall and Ryan, Mr. Ryan Grant, mm -hmm. brought to the table here, is in a very measured, thoughtful way, they presented the, the words of St. Robert Bellarmine, who is unimpeachable, 
in his witness of the traditional faith on this matter. And the point was made that there are five possible positions on this, according to St. Robert Bellarmine, and they are acceptable Catholic positions. That the church has not uh, condemned any of the th any of the five positions, nor has she defined any of the five positions. And these five positions have been enunciated in the course of the church's life, in the course of the years, by various respected theologians and even doctors in, of the faith. So one can adopt one of those five positions without fear of, of going against the Catholic faith. They are Catholic positions that are acceptable as Catholics. And what they were arguing uh, from St. Robert Bellarmine's words is not that, okay, we, we're, we give this position and we anathematize that as being un-Catholic. What they say is very few hold this position or this position is logically untenable for this reason that they give, mm -hmm. but they don't anathematize those who hold those positions as though they were not Catholic. Mm -hmm. So they don't, they don't arrogate to themselves that power, that authority to condemn positions that the church has not herself condemned. This is what, unfortunately, the dogmatic state of Vicantists do and what the dogmatic anti state of Vicantists do. They arrogate to themselves the authority to rule out certain positions that are certainly Catholic to hold. As those to say, you can't even question <clears throat> this, when in the fact, St. Robert Bellarmine made it very clear that it is questionable. For example, the, the dogmatic anti state of Vicantis <clears throat> lay down the law, they say, you can't even question that Francis might not be the Pope. You can't even think about that possibility, that he's not the Pope. <clears throat> but if you read St. Robert Bellarmine, he made it very clear that it is, it is a possibility, right. as a Catholic, to question that. And who are they to say, you can't, how dare you question this? Who are they to say that? They're arrogating to themselves magisterial authority to settle the question once and for all, for all Catholics, at all times, in all places. And they don't have that authority, see? Mm -hmm. So I think what uh, Dr. Marshall and uh, Ryan Grant have done, uh, trying to bring some reason uh, to the table here and have a rational, thoughtful Catholic discussion about the very serious issues that are facing the Catholic people today. Yeah. And that's exactly what we need. So I considered it to be a breath of fresh air myself. Sure. <clears throat> and that's what, you know, on this show we've been calling for all along anyway. Uh, but it, it, it seems that uh, it's, that request has fallen on deaf ears because people would much rather, um, uh, let's say, launch epithets <laughs> and uh, invective against those who disagree with them than actually sit down and, and talk about this as Catholics. Mm -hmm and discuss the, uh, the, the, the real issues. I mean, it's very important for, why the, for the dogmatic state of God is to ask themselves, well, why are people, why is this such a hot button issue? Why are people so almost afraid to even discuss this? What are the theological problems with it? Why are the, what are the concerns that they have about this that makes it so unthinkable to them? <clears throat> And the, those on the other side need to ask the same reason. I mean, what is it that is driving the dogmatic state of Vicantis? Uh, I mean, what, what are their concerns about this? Why are they find it absolutely, as they say, untenable to hold a position of the other side? Well, they need to start listening and realize there are theological implications in both sides. <clears throat> there are theological implications that can be very distressing and disturbing for people who actually interpret the other side to say, you're saying the church is finished. You're saying Christ's promise is void. You're saying the church has failed. Each side is basically saying that about the other side here. Well, somebody has to be able to sit down and think this through and then discuss this through and, and figure it out as Catholics. What is the Catholic position to hold here, the most reasonable thoughtful Catholic position to hold. And uh, I mean, personally, for what it's worth, I, I think, I think, as I expressed in the last video, the reasonable Catholic position to hold based upon the words of St. Robert Bellarmine is that it, it is the very least we can say, 
a plausible Catholic position, actually, and uh, that there is an objective doubt or a reason to question whether or not Francis, in fact, has the Catholic faith, whether or not he is a manifest heretic, and uh, that, therefore, that a reasonable position to hold that he would have lost the papacy if he ever had it. I mean, this, this is a, an opinion uh, voiced by St. Robert Bellarmine himself, that a manifest heretic cannot hold the Catholic papacy, right? So, um, uh, that to see that as a real, pay, uh, a real possibility. Now, that doesn't say we are arrogating to ourselves the power to answer the question, but it's not arrogance to ask the question, right? It is a legitimate question, mm -hmm. according to St. Robert Bellarmine. And raising that question then to realize, okay, since the, the authority that is commanding us to follow this new synodal path, <laughs> that he's charting out for us, since that authority is the very least we can say doubtful. And I know that as a Catholic, I have a, an undou undoubted and an indubitable responsibility to be faithful to Catholic tradition. That is a fact. That I know. There's no doubt about that. That I have to follow the tradition of my Catholic faith. That I, That's what I have to do. I cannot hearken to a very doubtful authority telling me to violate the tradition of the Catholic Church when my primary responsibility is to follow the tradition of the Church, which is the work of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> there is where my primary allegiance must be, and that's where my obedience must be, too, mm -hmm. which means practicing the traditional faith, uh, worshiping at the traditional Catholic Mass, <clears throat> receiving the traditional Catholic sacraments of the Roman Rite, Believing the teachings of the traditional Catholic catechism, right? the catechism of the Council of Trent, and so on. This is where my obligation lies right now. Mm -hmm. This is where I believe the obligation of every Catholic lies right now. Mm -hmm. And Father, I mentioned the, the email response that, that we received from this latest program, and I, I thought it was really encouraging and, and inspiring to read through a lot of the emails. I, I believe every one of them was 100% was uh, positive. Um, and favorable towards things you said. And I, I wanted to, to thank all of our viewers for sending those in because I think that uh, there are a lot of new viewers who have uh, come on board since we posted that program. And a lot of them kind of gave their background of how they have you know, come to tr tradition. And I, I thought it was really interesting just to read through some of those and see yeah. how, uh, how, how varied the, the backgrounds are. Um, sure. You know, we have, have people email us from the uh, SSPX and... Uh, you, you have them there, too. I, I do, and uh, That's good. they That's were... Good um, I, I thought every one of them was, was fantastic. Uh, one, one viewer said that uh, she watched the show twice and, and your, your words were music to her ears. Uh, another said uh, that, that it, was, it was great stuff. They really wanted to thank you for, for posting that video. And, and I think it, every, every single one of them was 100% positive. So I think it was really... Um, encouraging and inspiring to, to read through those. So I thought that was great. But there were a few follow-up questions to some of the things that you mentioned in that last show. And um, one of them was actually a, a common thread among several of the emails um, mm. in regards to the question of Catholic tradition. Okay. <clears throat> you said that uh, we Catholic tradition has a claim to our love, obedience, and affection. So could you just explain exactly what you mean by Catholic <clears throat> tradition and, and how, do, how do we have a prior obligation and a binding obedience to tradition? Well, we sometimes refer to ourselves as traditional Catholics in order to uh, distinguish the religion we practice from the, the Novus Ordo <clears throat> revolution that came in, the modernist revolution of Vatican, that followed upon Vatican II, right? Uh, but in fact, the title traditional Catholic is kind of a misnomer in the sense that <clears throat> it's almost like an oxymoron. You can't have a non-traditional Catholic. You can't have an untraditional Catholic. You can't have an anti-traditional Catholic. It's impossible because the Catholic faith teaches us <clears throat> that there are two fonts of divine revelation. And you have the font of Catholic tradition and you have the font of Catholic of, of scripture, sacred scripture. You have sacred tradition and sacred scripture. <clears throat> they are both the work of God. They are the work of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> And of the two, tradition came first. 
You might even say that Scripture is the outgrowth of tradition, especially the New Testament. You can say, absolutely, the New Testament Scriptures, beginning with the Gospels and going through the Acts of the Apostles, the Epistles, and so on, these are <clears throat> the records of Catholic tradition written down. Uh, the Church came first. Before the first word of any of the four Gospels was written, the Church was already justifying souls from sin, sanctifying souls by grace, <clears throat> saving souls and, you know, leading them to eternal glory, being glorified by God in heaven, before the very first word of any gospel was written down. <clears throat> and uh, because the church was doing this by the power of Jesus Christ, that he had committed to his apostles, entrusting to them with the command then to carry, and that he would be with, with the assurance he would be with them throughout the ages until the end of the world, the consummation of the world. So tradition actually came first. This is something that the Protestants have gotten all wrong. And um, it's a crime because, uh, it, you know, it leads them uh, in very wrong directions, okay? But in any case, um, so here we are. We, we look back over the years and we see the church, okay? We see the church acting. We see her, her judging things, right? And in her judgment, we have more than canon law here. We see how the church herself has actually judged cases. Now, we see the same thing in our own civil law, maybe as an analogy, I would say. When, when the church, when, when our, our uh, judicial powers of our government, so when, when, when things are brought before the judges here, what do they do? They judge on the basis of precedent, okay? okay? And this is very big in, in cases, uh, judicial cases involving precedent, to see how our Constitution was applied, how it was interpreted, to see how, what our, laws, uh, our laws meant and how they were understood and how they were applied is very, very important. Well, all the more so in the Church's history. I mean, precedent for us is Catholic tradition. That's what we go by. And we see year by year, decade by decade, century by century, the church judging and exercising her powers of judgment. She is manifesting her tradition, her understanding of her own laws. <clears throat> One can take the code of canon law disembodied and start trying to interpret it. But that would be like trying to take sacred scripture out of context. <clears throat> And canon law, you might say, is not in itself, right, divinely revealed, but it is an outgrowth of divine revelation because, it, again, it's an application of the church's judgment of what are right and wrong and so on. In any case, when you go back to sacred tradition, though, you go to something that is a divine revelation. It is the work of the Holy Ghost in the life of the church. And uh, so that's what we're saying we have to do now. That's our vantage point now. Uh, we have to go back and follow the tradition of the church and how she judged things then. And we can understand the mind of the church. And, uh, and in her judgments, we again see the guidance of the Holy Ghost at work. So if you look back at that, I mean, we see that there are things that the church has always and everywhere insisted were right, the right thing to do. And not only right, but necessary to be Catholic. And we take that as part of Catholic tradition, the consistent voice of the church saying, this is always right, this is what we always want you to do, to be Catholic. But you also see the consistent voice of the church in saying there are certain things that are completely incompatible with being Catholic, which you must never do as a Catholic, <clears throat> that are always condemned. This is the voice of Catholic tradition. This is her judgment. This is her judgment coming to us across the ages. It is, again, the voice of the Holy Ghost. And we also see there's a third category of things. <clears throat> and these are things that the church says, well, ordinarily this would be wrong. However, under these circumstances, for example, in missionary circumstances, or in times of crisis, in times of confusion, we want you to default to this. And we've seen the church go through these times of crisis <clears throat> and what the Catholic people have done, what Catholic laity have done, what the Catholic priests have done, what the Catholic bishops have done. <clears throat> And we see the, church, the church's judgment 
of what they did, saying this was the right thing to do in, the t- in times of crisis. And again, this is a third, a third aspect of things that we must do. If we're going to be traditional, this is what we see. We take that judgment of the church throughout the centuries and we apply it now. We say, this is what the church has said we must always do <laughs> to be Catholic. This is what the church has said we must never do to be Catholic. And these are the things in times of crisis and confusion the church says she wants us to do because we've seen the examples of Catholics who've gone before us and what they've did and what the, what they've done and what the church has approved and said this was the right thing to do. And what, one of the prime examples, for example, uh, one of the prime examples is what Catholics did during the time of a papal crisis, the time of Pope Honorius, <clears throat> Pope in the, in the six the year, well in the six thirties, okay. <clears throat> who was presented with actually an attempt of ecumenism back then by a, the patriarch of Constantinople, a man named Sergius. He was trying to be ecumenical back then by introducing some kind of ambiguous statement of faith that the Catholics could recite, but the heretics could recite. It was so ambiguous, they could both say the same words. They didn't mean the same thing, but it gave the veneer of unity. And this was uh, denounced to Pope Honorius I. It was denounced as a falsification of the faith, an insult to the faith, actually scandalous and dangerous to the faith of peoples, to introduce that ambiguity, that heterodoxy. And so um, Sophronius, who was a bishop of Jerusalem, was one of those who denounced this, this ecumenical adventure of the patriarch of Constantinople, Sergius, to Honorius I. Honorius failed miserably. His solution, we will not speak about these things. These are divisive matters. We're not going to talk about this. So he enjoined silence on everyone. Okay. So the question was, uh, what should Catholics do? And the Catholics of the time Sophronius, Maximus the Confessor, and so on, would not be silenced by the command of that Pope because it was against the faith. It was a betrayal of the faith. And so, contrary not only to what Honorius the Pope had commanded, but even contrary to the Emperor of the time and his, his uh, he, he issued a, an edict, right? Punishable, such that breaking the um, uh, disobeying Honorius and speaking about these things uh, made one liable to punishment by the civil law. In fact, Maximus the Confessor suffered and died as a martyr because he did speak up and continued to condemn the heresy and speak boldly about what the true faith taught. The he- heresy was monothelitism, which uh, eventually, was it, a, it was actually an attack on the humanity of our Lord. The, the, an attack on the incarnation is what it was. That God the Son did not fully become fully human and take a fully human nature. And uh, this was an attack on the incarnation. So you see how much was at stake in here. This is, I mean, the whole faith revolves around that incarnation, right? So, um, but what was the church judgment of this? I mean, you had Honorius, universally regarded as a pope at the time. You had uh, those who were subordinate to him, Bishop of Jerusalem. You had others too. And they flagrantly disobeyed him. Before the century was out, before the sixth century, the seventh century closed, Honorius was condemned for his failure even listed among the heretics, because he favored heresy. And uh, effectively, by what he had commanded. And those who had disobeyed him were canonized. I mean, we have the Feast of St. Maximus the Confessor and St. Sophronius now in the universal calendar of the Church for the example that he set of speaking up for the faith when it is probably the most difficult when they were ordered by ecclesiastical authority to be silent. Uh, so again, here you have the tradition of the church and the, and the voice of the Holy Ghost speaking in that judgment of what we are to do, what we are to do today. 
where there we find the answer. You see, so I just use that as an example to say to explain what I mean by it. There are certain things we must never do as Catholics, and that is compromise the faith. We must always do as Catholic and speak out boldly for the faith, regardless of who orders us to be silent. Mm -hmm. This is this is the voice of Catholic tradition here. The the true Mass, the traditional Mass of the Roman Rite, the traditional sacraments. These also are the work of Catholic tradition and the Holy Ghost guiding the faith. No one can ever anathematize those. No one can ever pronounce those not Catholic. One, no one can, can deny that Catholics have a right to those and an obligation to hold to them, to hold fast to them. Mm -hmm. And so, um, again, uh, the Church would anathematize those who would try to prevent the Catholic people from practicing the traditional Catholic faith and would say that as Catholics we have an obligation to do exactly that, to practice the traditional Catholic faith in the traditional Catholic religion, of which the traditional Roman Mass of the Roman Rite is the centerpiece, really, uh, the center of that worship. So uh, if, if one asks, well, what, is, what do you mean by this when you talk about tradition? I'm talking about what the Church has given to us. What did St. Paul, I mean, all the way back then, right? Back when he was writing uh, to the Thessalonians, his second letter to the Thessalonians, when he told them in the time of the Antichrist, <clears throat> hold fast to the traditions you've received by the word of my mouth or by written, the written letter of the Scriptures. So he's talking about by tradition and Scripture, hold fast to those things. And he's writing this probably about 50, 50 A.D., already back then. He says, these are the standards we must follow. And he was saying that specifically about the time of the Antichrist, which at that time was far in the future, as far as anyone knew. Father, if I were to ask you to give a, a one-sentence definition of that would be very Catholic, difficult. Catholic tradition, what would you say? I'm not an admirer of Immanuel Kant. <laughs> okay. But he's uh, known for... Uh, what sentences that went yeah. on for pages, okay? Yeah. But this is in German, in German okay? Yeah. I'll try to avoid falling into that, that pitfall yeah. or pratfall or whichever you want to <laughs> choose. So. Yeah. But a, de 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 a definition of Catholic tradition mm -hmm. is actually the guidance of the Holy Ghost in, in, in practice in the churches, uh, the practice of the Catholic religion. Okay. Fair enough. Just off the top of my head, that's how I would, I would define it. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, Father, no, no, what the church has approved, what the church has condemned, uh, this, is what we, this is our standard, how the church has judged things. Sure. Uh, Father, another um, question, another follow-up question from our previous, previous video has to do with the uh, idea of a doubtful authority. Um, so you said that... Um, uh, that um, we have the liberty not to do what is commanded by a doubtful authority. Um, could you expound upon that a little bit more? Why, why do we have that liberty, and would it be sinful if we were to um, obey a doubtful authority? Would we be giving scandal? Would that actually be a sin of scandal? Well, uh, you know, the doubtful authority might be commanding something that is in itself indifferent, or even good, right? If, if someone were to come up to you on the street and say, uh, look, you don't know me and I don't know you, but I am the mayor of this town, and by law you are required to make a donation to this charity that we have here. So you are obliged to do that. Uh, would you be obliged by law to do that? No. Why not? Doubtful authority. <laughs> you never know who this is. You know who he is, right? He yeah. might be just uh, kind of hanging out on the street, uh, you know, raising funds for his favorite charity. It might be himself, you know. <laughs> uh, you have no idea who this is. You don't know if he is who he says he is. And even if he were the mayor, is it really the law? You don't even know if what he's telling you mm -hmm. is true. And so, because the very least you can say well, I don't know that you're not the mayor, and I don't know that there is no law like that. I don't know. I happen to be visiting your town here. You tell me you're the mayor. You tell me there's a law to this effect, and that it applies to me as a visitor 
who uh, stopped in to eat at your diner on, on my way, you know, to Saskatchewan or whatever. And I, I can't prove that you're not who you are right now, but uh, that's not my obligation to prove that you're not the mayor. The fact is that I don't know that you are, and I do not have an obligation to do what you're saying here. Certainly no moral obligation, <clears throat> okay? Um, I mean, this is common sense. Anybody could uh, say, I am so-and-so, I have the authority over you to command this, and you have to obey me, right? Uh, and you don't have the obligation to obey. Now, it might turn out that the man was the mayor and that there is a law, and yes, okay, uh, but that has to be verified in your case before you have any obligation, you know, mm -hmm. any obligation there. <clears throat> but it's a different case when somebody is saying, I am the mayor of this town and there is a law and you have to obey it that you have to go rob the bank or you have to uh, throw stones at somebody's car, you know, or you have to... Uh, 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 hamper, the, you know, uh, cut, cut the fireman's hoses, you know, if you see them, you know, you're putting out fires. I mean, any number of things that he could command you to do that you know would be wrong to do. Now, here you have a command of a doubtful authority that is commanding you to do something that you know is wrong, okay? Then it certainly would be sinful to obey that, okay? Um, because they're commanding you to do something that is contrary to an obligation that you have otherwise, right? You know there are higher laws that say, don't, you can't do that. That's wrong to do these things. And you have somebody presuming to tell you, I have the authority to tell you to do something that, that you know is wrong. You have an obligation to, to refuse to obey, right? Would it be disobedience to say no to that person? Would it be obedience to say, yes, I will do as you say? No, that wouldn't be obedience. It would be the contrary of obedience. Because you would be actually defying a higher authority that is certain. <clears throat> and instead, do something wrong at the, at the behest of an authority that is very questionable. We're in that situation now where we have an authority that is very questionable that there is actually objective reason to doubt uh, that there is that authority there, or certainly that they have the authority to command what they're commanding. And on the other hand, we have a certain obligation to obey Catholic tradition, which is actually the work of the Holy Ghost in the Church. So for us to abandon the obligation, the certain obligation we have to be faithful to Catholic tradition, and to hearken to a voice that might not even have that authority or, well, be the authority or, even, or at least have the authority to command what it's commanding. That would be sinful to do that. Okay. Um, now, I mean, let's say, let's say the voice is commanding us to do something in a case that is not in itself sinful. <clears throat> I was talking to a, a priest of the Society of St. Pi uh, Pius X. The Society of St. Pius X. <clears throat> And uh, I, I proposed a case to him because he was telling me that the Society of St. Pius X gives the benefit of the doubt to Francis, okay? In this case, actually, it was John Paul II, they said. And so I said to him, well, all right, suppose, suppose John Paul II were to command everyone, let's say, to command all the people, the Catholic people in the world, to fast and abstain on Wednesday of this week for world peace, for peace for mankind. I said, would you obey that command? Would you consider that to be a, a, a true command that you would be in, obliged to obey in conscience? And would you tell the people in your churches and your missions that they were obliged in conscience to fast and abstain this Wednesday for, for peace in the world because John Paul II said so, commanded that, and his answer was, absolutely not. Absolutely not, he said. I would not do that. I would not feel obliged to obey that, nor would I tell the other people, the traditional Catholic, who are coming to my traditional Catholic chapel or mission, 
nor would I tell them they have an obligation to fast and abstain because John Paul II said so. And they said, well, now wait a minute, how is that giving him the benefit of the doubt? <laughs> he said, he said Don't, you said you recognize that authority, and they're not, do you think it's sinful to command fast and abstinence? <clears throat> no. Well, do you think it's sinful to, com to uh, command fast and abstinence for world peace? <clears throat> because after all, Our Lady said we had to offer penance and, 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 and sacrifices for peace, right? And would that not be consonant with the command of our Blessed Mother at Fatima? He said, well, here's the problem. When, when liberals and modernists talk about world peace, they're actually talking about ecumenism, and, which is like a false religious principle. And so I would, I would refuse that command and refuse obedience to it because what they really mean is ecumenism, that all religions basically you know, are the same ultimately and get along and so on. And, and I said, well, well, wait a minute, you're, you're parsing his words to mean something that, it doesn't, that they don't say. So how is, again, that giving him the benefit of the doubt? I, my point is that this was, not, this was not correct. It just wasn't true that they're giving him the benefit of the doubt. And you know what he said to me? He said to me, well, you wouldn't do it. And this is the strange thing uh, to him. I mean, he was flabbergasted by it. I told him, well, of course I would. If I were convinced that John Paul II, beyond any shadow of the doubt, was the vicar of Christ on earth, and he was giving a command like that, I would certainly obey. <clears throat> and I would tell everybody in the parishes that they had an obligation to obey that. Uh, and I said to him, that's the difference between you and, well, basically what it comes down to, the Society of St. Pius V and the Society of St. Pius X, that we have the spirit of obedience. We take that authority very seriously, which is why we take the position we do. We take that authority very seriously. You just can't kind of switch it on and switch it off. <clears throat> um, uh, depending on, you know, whether you like it or not. So, uh, in any case, um, the, the, what, why, what am I, why am I, I saying all of this, Tom? Well, basically because um, the, the command itself, uh, coming from a, um, a doubtful authority, is not necessarily an evil command. But still, if I obeyed it, it would not necessarily be obedience, it would be charity. For example, if, if a doubtful authority commanded me to perform an act of charity to some homeless person, saying, okay, you have an obligation, I'm commanding you to give $10 to this homeless person. <clears throat> well, if I gave the $10 to the homeless person, it wouldn't be because I thought somebody had authority to command me to do so but I would be out of charity that I would do so. But, but when the doubtful authority is commanding me to do something that is contrary to my faith, contrary to Catholic tradition, contrary to Catholic scripture, I couldn't do that out of charity, and I couldn't do it out of obedience. Out of obedience and out of charity, I would have to refuse to do what I was told if it was something wrong. And this is the situation with the modernists now. They've gotten into these positions, they've invaded these positions, and they're trying to use obedience, as Monsignor Lefebvre himself said. They're trying to abuse Catholic obedience to carry out their plans to subvert the Church. And Catholics not only don't have an obligation to obey them, Catholics have an obligation not to do their wishes. And it is a matter of being obedient to Catholic tradition, the work of the Holy Ghost, to the Church, to Christ Himself, that they refuse to do what the modernists command them to do mm -hmm. in order to fulfill their modernist plans of subverting the Church. That's, that's the situation we're dealing with today. Father, we just have a couple of minutes left, but I, I wanted to ask, what are your thoughts on the, uh, the, the current impeachment proceedings that, uh, that, that recently took place? and? in Washington with President Trump. Um, you know, we've, we've been talking a lot about authority and uh, obeying the, uh, the commands of authority. Do you see any mm -hmm. kind of um, 
correlation there between the the impeachment proceedings that are happening here in America and and all of this talk with um, you know Francis and his doubtful authority and the state of economism yeah. question. What what are your thoughts? Well, about of this? course, I mean, I'm glad you asked that question, Tom, because uh, you, you cannot impeach a pope. Okay, Catholics know that, right? I mean, it's clear from what St. Robert Bellarmine said. You cannot impeach a pope the way you can impeach a president because there's no council, mm -hmm. no Senate, no House of Representatives that has authority to, uh, to fire a pope, right? Uh, find him guilty of crimes and say, you can't be pope anymore because we have the authority to, to, um, to depose you, okay? Um, <clears throat> So that, that is why Dr. Marshall and Ryan Grant made it so clear that the fourth position uh, that St. Robert Bellarmine presents, that of Cajetan, has problems because the idea of calling a council to make a judgment about whether the, pope, whether the man is pope or not uh, smacks too much of conciliarism, which we know the church has said is false, a false position. And uh, as uh, Ryan Grant made very clear, I think, that he's very uncomfortable with the position of Cajetan, the fourth position presented by St. Robert Bellarmine, because it sounds as though it could lend itself to the interpretation that you can call a council and the council can pronounce a judgment which effectively deposes an actual pope. <clears throat> Even if it's for the reason of manifest heresy. Um, so that is why both, as I recall, uh, Dr. Marshall and Ryan Grant uh, went with the position of, of St. Robert Bellarmine himself, which was the fifth position. But they added, though, then the, uh, the, that position was that a pope loses the papacy when he becomes a manifest heretic because he has lost the faith. It's obvious. It's patent. And uh, when he has publicly lost the faith, so he has publicly lost the papacy because he is no longer a Catholic. And you have to be a Catholic to be the Pope. Okay? Uh, they actually presented that as like the common position, okay? <clears throat> as I recall. But then they raised the question, but how do we know that he's a manifest heretic? It can't be up to the individuals to decide that for themselves. And that's where they raised the specter of, well, you have to get a council together of the bishops and they'd have to they'd have to simply make the, the, the statement uh, acknowledging the fact of his manifest heresy. They're not deposing him. They don't have the authority to depose him. They're just acknowledging the fact of his manifest heresy and that therefore by virtue of his manifest heresy, he stopped being a Catholic and therefore he stopped being the Pope. Okay? So they're acknowledging a fact, not executing some kind of judicial act this is where they're trying to make this distinction here. But what I brought up in the video we, we made earlier is, again, you, you come back to the same problem, though, that, uh, you know, at some point in, in the case of a pope like that, assuming the man ever was a pope, because assuming that he was a Catholic, right, to the, in the first place, okay, uh, and he actually became the pope and uh, became the supreme pontiff and the vicar of Christ on earth, if he ever wants that, he could lose it by manifest heresy. So you have the case of a man who becomes a, a pope who becomes a manifest heretic, denying a doctrine of faith, which is a defined doctrine of faith, with, faith which must be believed by an obligation of divine and Catholic faith, divine, defined by the church, and now he, he denies it publicly, right? <clears throat> At some point in time, then, that becomes manifest, like a public declaration of this. So it's like notorious, right? It doesn't mean everybody in the world sees it, everybody in the world admits it, but the fact is, it is what it is, and a goodly number of people who know what the faith is say that is a notorious heresy, that's a manifest heresy. Well, now the question arises, well, uh, at what, what point do you, can you authoritatively say that <clears throat> so that it, it becomes a fact that everybody can acknowledge, okay? You go through the, the matter of the fact that, that someone becomes a manifest heretic, a pope becomes a manifest heretic, 
And then you get together a council of bishops, finally, who will declare at some future time that he became a manifest heretic when he said this five months ago, 15 months ago, five years ago. He became a manifest heretic at that moment. But what they're actually saying is, we are acknowledging the fact that at that time he became a manifest heretic, he lost the faith, he lost the papacy then. <clears throat> well, as though we can't do anything about it until they get together and make that statement of fact. All that time has passed. He's been functioning as a pope. So this raises a serious question that you might, you might say to them, okay, at what point did he actually stop being the pope? Did he stop being the Pope when he became the Manifest Heretic? Or did he stop becoming the Pope when you declared the fact that he was a Manifest Heretic? <clears throat> well, if he stopped being the Pope when you declared that he was a Manifest Heretic, then is that not you saying that you have the authority to say he stopped being the Pope when we said so? <laughs> and isn't that another way of coming back to the same problem? And if you say, well, we're simply acknowledging the fact that 15 months ago when he said this and did this, he became a manifest heretic, are you saying that he stopped being the Pope at that point? And if he stopped being the Pope at that point, what happened to all, during all that time that he continued functioning as Pope and everybody, according to you, was supposed to acknowledge that he was still a Pope until you said, guess what, he's a manifest heretic, so he wasn't the Pope. Mm -hmm. You see, there are problems with, with these things. So there, there are questions that need to be asked need to be asked, and there are questions that need to be answered. And the only way we can actually deal with this is by, well, I think doing exactly what uh, Dr. Grant and, uh, or Mr. Grant and Dr. Uh, uh, Marshall did. Let's sit down and let's actually talk about this, put these questions on the table, look at the various possible Catholic answers to this, and uh, try, to, try to arrive at the prudent thing to do. What, what practical steps do we take? Personally, I, I, I personally, for what it's worth, don't think we have to answer the question that is beyond our pay grade, so to speak, question that we are not competent to answer. <clears throat> I think we have the competence to ask the question, as St. Robert Bellarmine did in presenting these various positions. But I think if we're insisting that we have to have the competence to answer the questions with regard to, for example, state of accountism and so on, I think we're, we're, we're exceeding not only the competence, I think we're exceeding the need to know what to do. Because if we just acknowledge the very least that I think we can prudently say, there is definitely an objective doubt here about Francis having the faith and therefore having the papacy. If we could express the doubt about that, a prudent doubt, that's all we need. Because <clears throat> we know what we have to do. We have to practice the traditional Catholic faith regardless of what anyone says. Because mm -hmm. okay? this is what our Lord tells us, this is what the Holy Ghost tells us. And uh, this is what the Church herself has told us throughout all these centuries. That's what we have to do. And that's the answer we really need right now. Anything beyond that, I, I think, um, is a matter of dispute, and it's going to be divisive. But I think we all have to agree, what I'd like to see us all agree, is on one thing, that we have to practice the traditional Catholic faith regardless, and, and simply reject the modernist revolution, which, again, I go back to Dr. Marshall's book, Infiltration, portrayed quite well, outlined quite well. That's what we have to reject, the modernist revolution. You know, Tom, I've said before, and I'm sorry I go on here, but so many, uh, you know, across the spectrum, you know, you have those uh, who want to practice the traditional Catholic faith, the traditional mass, traditional sacraments, and in the, in the entirety, right? The entire traditional Catholic religion they want to practice. But they are divided now over these questions. But oddly enough, they're all united in all wanting the traditional... They're united in recognizing the churches in a state of crisis. They're all united in that. 
They're all united in realizing the crisis is caused by modernism. They're all united in the idea that the antidote to the poison of modernism is Catholic tradition. And they all say we want to follow Catholic tradition. And they all say we want the traditional Catholic faith in the traditional catechisms, the Roman catechism, the catechism of the Council of Trent. We all believe that. We're united in that faith. They all say we want the traditional Roman rite of mass. We want the traditional uh, Catholic sacraments. That's what we want. We're all united in the worship that we want. And we're all united again in recognizing Catholic tradition as being above all human authority here on earth, including the popes and the papacy, which exists to preserve Catholic tradition, to serve it, not to destroy it. We're all united in that. <clears throat> but then when it comes down to the practical application of what it is to be traditional, that's where the divergence occurs. And that's why it separates us. If we get all agree on that, what it is to be traditional and to practice the traditional Catholic religion, we can solve this problem. And I think the divisions are artificial in that people are hammering away at questions that they're trying to answer the questions for everybody by saying, okay, this is my position and this is the only possible position. And I anathematize those who don't agree with me. I get back to where we started. I think the program that Dr. Marshall and, and, uh, and Mr. Grant put out simply made it very clear that St. Robert Bellarmine made it very clear that there are these various positions and they are all acceptable Catholic positions. And you can't have somebody who accepts position five <laughs> anathematizing those who accept position two and vice versa. Because mm. then they're arrogating to themselves authority that they don't have. Talk about a false authority. There you have it, and precisely that. Mm -hmm. So they're reacting to a situation where there's a questionable authority by themselves adopting authority they don't have, and they're guilty of the very same problem. Mm -hmm. well, Father, what, what, what about President Trump and, and the, the oh. failed impeachment proceedings there? What do you, what do you, can we draw any more clear oh conclusions uh, in that case? Better that reset the clock here. Uh, 30 oh. seconds or less. Uh, oh, dear, I don't know. Well, look, this... The whole impre impeachment proceeding was undertaken by the Democrats yes. who want to unseat President Trump because okay. they have, could never accept that President Trump was actually became the president and is now the president of the United States of America. They will not accept it, period. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, they're also facing the reality they cannot defeat him in the upcoming election. That sets in with them. They realize that. And so they have to do whatever it is, however desperate the measure is, um, in the hopes that something will happen, so that they have a weapon to use then, will, that will give them, you know, some, something to hold over his head. So they brought up this impeachment, these articles of impeachment. And I think most people realize that they're pretty much, you know, whole cloth, um, that, that they, they don't amount to anything. That's what the Senate decided. And, um, but... One thing I think the American people need to know is that the Democrats have done this on our dime, so to speak. I mean, the Democratic National Committee is not paying for this. This is the way of the Democratic Party uh, attacking the presidency of a sitting Republican president and spending the money of the American people to do it, not their own monies. <clears throat> and uh, so they are using public monies uh, derived from taxation of Democrats and Republicans, wage earners in this country, to uh, Im implement this plan. And when it got to the Senate and the president had an opportunity to defend himself, he had lawyers and others he had to pay, research and so on, and the Republicans had to pay that. Um, they, didn't, they weren't able to reach into public monies, as the Democrats did, to pay for the defense of President Trump. <clears throat> so it was like a, a twofold fiscal insult, as it were, right? Um, and now they're saying that 
the Senate's acquittal of President Trump was null and void because they didn't call witnesses, which they had no obligation to do, obviously. Because the, the uh, House Democrats failed to make their case. They wanted the, the Senate to make their case for them. And it's not the obligation of the Senate to make the case for the Democrats, okay? And, um, I mean, one could say so much about these proceedings. It, it's almost, when, I mean, volumes and volumes will be written about this, okay? But now they're talking about starting another, uh, another impeachment proceeding in the House. And going back and repeating, you know, does it bring up new charges and trying, floating more balloons out there to see if they can get traction, okay? And they want to keep this controversy going uh, because they feel that eventually the American people will, will cave in themselves. I don't think there are any, illusion, any illusions that, that uh, Donald Trump is going to cave in at this point. <laughs> But I think they think the American people are going to become tired of this. They're going to say the only way we can escape this, uh, like Groundhog's Day problem with the, the, the Democrats starting over and over and over again, endless rounds of impeachment, is to finally uh, get somebody else in there, vote Trump out of office. But actually, the only way to really escape this is if the, for the Democrats not to have control of the House. Because as long as the Democrats have control of the House of Representatives, this is what they're going to do. This is what their leaders are saying they intend to do. At least they're floating these as real possibilities. Okay, so um, uh, the question is whether, the Ameri whether they pursue this course again, the Democrats in the House, and whether the American people will say, okay, well, the, uh, we'll have to eventually just surrender and get rid of President Trump and get somebody else in there, or we have to stop the Democrats from doing this again. And the only way we can do this is, is not let them have control of the House of Representatives. Uh, what's going to happen? Of course, I don't know. Um, but, you know, there are indications that the American people uh, who are not represented by the uh, the literati, glitterati, and the elite, as they are called, that they realize there's something wrong, and they they are really um, not in favor of this whole process. They don't they don't want this. They don't want this happen to their country. And uh, they are m many of the American people are rather well disgusted and horrified by the behavior of certain democratic leaders in all of this who simply thought that if they repeat it over and over and over and over and over again, their feelings about President Trump, that that would become policy for the, for the people of America. Okay. I think there, there is enough uh, rationality left in the American people that they recognize this. And so they're not going to be held hostage by this, not going to allow themselves to be held hostage by this anymore. At least, I hope not. Okay, I pray that they will see this. But, uh, you know, ult ultimately, uh, it, it is a moral question. It is a question of, uh, of, of, of right and wrong, okay, a question of morality. And a people whose intellect is darkened by sin can be very easily led astray and deceived. So this is the question of the morality of the American people. Our founding fathers understood this very well, that a republic is a form of government that absolutely requires its citizens to be moral because they have to self-govern, meaning they have to be able to govern themselves individually, right? And if you have an immoral person, he is not capable of governing himself. People who are not capable of governing themselves often wind up in prison. And uh, because they, they have to be controlled, they do not have self-control. Well, we're talking about morality, we're talking about virtue. We need a virtuous people, and not only the virtues of prudence and justice and fortitude and temperance, the fundamental virtues called the cardinal virtues, we need a people with the supernatural virtues of faith and hope and charity, starting with a belief in God, a hope in God, and a love for God. Without that, we are lost. 
everything will end in tyranny otherwise, uh, inevitably will end in tyranny. And we see the rising call for socialism in America. Um, um, this is something to be feared. So we see the, 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 the lines being drawn now, you know, as to which way it's going to be. The, the, the future of the American people is hanging in the balance right now. Um, but if, if, um, if people do not, as Our Lady said at Fatima, stop sinning at offending God, the outcome is already cast. You know, there's no way to escape it. <clears throat> there's no way to escape the, the judgment of God for our sins. So we have to be militant for the conversion of our people uh, to faith and hope and charity. And we, we have to, uh, that's where we have to focus our efforts on that. I mean, the, the, the solution is not going to be a political solution. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be a social, social solution, economic solution, any of that. It, it has to be a moral solution, which ultimately has to be the work of God in the human soul, the conversion of sinners. Um, so th that's, that's where our focus has to be. We see the corruption that is set in in government with the, the, the abortion until birth. I mean, how corrupt can one be? And if one is in favor of that, what evil is beyond the, the scope of people who are willing to do that? What, are the, what evil are they incapable of? Where would they stop? No, we don't know. Uh, if they will not stop at that. Um, so we see that there's, there, there are tremendous evils besetting our country, and we have to pray uh, very, very, very assiduously to God, incessantly to God for mercy, and we have to work, work for that in everything that we can do and stand up for what is right. Um, you know, we, you talked about uh, President Trump. I mean, he himself, I mean, we're not ready to canonize him by any means, okay? But we have to pray for his salvation, too. We have to pray for him that he be strong uh, for what is right and for the right reasons. Uh, and all of those who are involved in this, in this struggle right now, because it is a, an epic struggle, right? It is an epical struggle. And uh, we might say not only the fate of the United States of America hangs on this, uh, but the fate of the, of the world, actually, depends on what, what, what is the outcome of this, this whole uh, epic struggle between good and evil right now. We couch it in those terms because that's exactly what it is right now. So in any way, Tom, I just kind of uh, wrap up with that idea. Um, um, in any case, um, I, uh, uh, we can talk about this further in, in upcoming <laughs> shows right now, sure. but I think we need to let everybody escape. Yeah, right? that was just a little bit longer than 30 seconds, Father. Yeah. But I, well, the 25 I we'll words or less. I mean, when you, when you talk about, you know... Weighty matters. When, when, you, when you say, okay, well, how do you relate what's happening in Washington, what's happening in the Vatican, and the impeachment of President Trump, and the question of Francis? I mean, this is obviously not a 25 words or less. It's not a yes or no answer. question. This is not a yes or no <laughs> answer, certainly. Sounds uh, good. So anyway... Um, right. Okay. Well, Father, thanks we for being here. We have to do. Appreciate your time. Appreciate all of your, your insight and your leadership. And I know all of our viewers do as well. So thank you very much. Well, the greatest anything anybody can do for our, for our country is to implore the mercy of God at the foot of the true altar, at the foot of the true mass, the sacrifice of Calvary. So that's where we all have to find our way there. That's where the eagles will gather, right? Right. Thank all you, right. Father. God bless you, Tom. Yeah. Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima, to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and finally, to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you.